Yep, we are live. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to our fifth NHB seminar given by Professor Angelo Carollo. Before introducing our speaker, let me quickly remind all of you about uh, our house rules. So to save the bandwidth, I encourage everyone to turn off their cameras. We in principle only accept questions after the talk, so during the Q&A, please use the raise hand button uh, so that you will be unmuted and you will be able to ask your questions in person from the speaker. For those friends joining us via YouTube, I encourage you that you write your questions in the chat box so one of the moderators can pass the questions to the speaker. Same as always, you can find further details on the code of conduct and privacy policies on our website, so please check that out. An important announcement regarding our upcoming seminars is that we will be taking, we will be taking a summer break in August and September, so stay tuned for another round of exciting presentations in October. With this being said, I'm very much uh, excited to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Angelo Corollo. Angelo got his PhD uh, from the Imperial College London in 2004. After his graduation, he has been employed as a researcher at multiple places, including University of Cambridge, Innsbruck University, and also a short stay in the industry sector. In 2009, he joined the University of Palermo, where he's currently holding an associate professorship position. His area of expertise is quite diverse, but the two of his main research interests are quantum optics and open systems. Today, he's going to walk us through some of his results on exotic effects and topology in Hermitian and non-Hermitian waveguide QED. With this being said, Angela, we are very much looking forward to your presentation and stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharad. Um, so I'll, um, I'll share my screen. So, um, so that uh, you can all see the slides. Okay. Um, here you go. Um, I suppose that you can see the slide now. Can you? Yes. Okay. So again, uh, thanks a lot for the nice intro introduction. And uh, I, I would like to thank you for this uh, kind invitation to take a talk in this uh in this series. So uh, this, is a, this is a work which has been done in a joint collaboration with uh, many people here. Um, so the, and the, the, the topic is uh, basically, this talk is divided in two, main, uh, in, in two main parts. In the first part, I will discuss some exotic interaction which are happening um, basically uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Hamiltonian, which are mediated by some lattice which are in, intrinsically not emission. So uh, that's the first part. In the second part, I will discuss some uh, some sort of a mathematical uh, or uh, if you want some more uh, abstract uh, relations between uh, the topology of uh, effective Hamiltonians between emitters and the topology on, uh, on, um, on environment. To which these uh, emitters are interacting to. So let's start uh, immediately with some, uh, with the first part, with some uh, motivation. So first of all, the setting that I will, uh, I'm, I'm mostly keen on in this, uh, in this uh, topic is uh, the setting of waveguide QED. So in a waveguide QED, uh, you essentially have an environment which is made essentially by, by a, a light which propagates around a uh, uh, a constrained environment, which is which could be, for example, a nanofiber. It could be a, a, a superconducting waveguide, and or could be a super con, or could be um, uh, well a superconducting waveguide or any type of uh, photonic, uh, for example, waveguide. And uh, in this type of situation, you can uh, ima imagine or you can realize. Uh, emitters which are coupled to this type of environment. So what emitters, I mean, uh, you, you can imagine having cold atoms, for example, in this prototypical example here, cold atoms interacting with nanofibers. You can have, for example, uh, superconducting qubits interacting with uh, suitable uh, superconducting uh, uh, nanofiber, uh, waveguide, sorry. Or you can have, uh, for example, silicon vacancies, quantum dots, and so forth. Or you can even have a, a very exotic type of uh, uh, emitters, which are not coupled just in one point, but these are maybe coupled in more than one point at once. And these are known, are called nowadays 
giant atom because they defeat the standard dipole approximation type of uh, approach. So this is the, the, the context in which I will consider the both parts of, of the talk today. So the idea is having a bunch of two level system emitters and uh, these emitters are coupled, as I said before, to a waveguide, which you could imagine it as a, a 1D, to set uh, an example, a 1D continuum of modes. And then uh, it, to make things a little bit more uh, playful, you can imagine that this 1D continuum is actually structured in terms of a array of coupled cavity. So then, uh, then you can imagine that this coupled cavity realizes a sort of uh, tight binding model, which is the simplest way in which you can uh, you can realize this type of situation uh, and this uh, but you can imagine that this uh, this uh, structured array of cavity could be coupled in a more diverse way with uh, with coupling which are changes from side to side and this gives rise uh, of a for, for a different type of phenomena in this type of situation what i'm really interested in here is to understand what happens at the level of the of the emitters, and for that I mean, imagine that you want to describe the effective interaction which happens between one emitter and the others, which are all coupled by the same waveguide. So, in a word, we want to see the interaction mediated by the waveguide. And technically, what people do is uh, they adiabatically eliminate the degrees of freedom of, uh, of the waveguide and see what happens at the effective Hamiltonian, so the effective interaction that comes out uh, uh, out of this uh, of this uh, mediate interaction. So the technically technically what I will assume is that the uh, the waveguide, is going to have a set of uh, of eigenmodes which are distributed according to the sort of uh, a photonic uh, sort of, a, of of bands, and these bands can be usually are usually um, limited bands, so they are very structured. We are not in an open uh, we are not in the open space, so these. Uh, this structure give rise to different type of bands, and you may also have band gaps. So I will assume that the, the frequency of the emitters in this scenario are tuned all at the same frequency. Mostly, I will assume that these frequency are uh, tuned in the middle of some uh, uh, photonic uh, gaps. So there's no uh, there's no modes propagating at that frequency essentially. And now we'll assume that this coupling G, the coupling between the atoms and the, and, and the waveguide, is very small compared to the uh, to the gap uh, that uh, to the gap to the the, the, the the way the width of the gap. Under this assumption, you can describe easily the effective interaction with this the, uh, between atom, these atoms through this effective Hamiltonian, which, uh, which looks like this, where omega e is the uh, frequency of uh, the emitters and HOP is the Hamiltonian, the bare Hamiltonian describing the, the, the waveguide essentially. So that's the setting. Um, again, to make things simple, so the waveguide uh, is, uh, we will assume that the waveguide is essentially translational invariant. So in this setting, you have traveling modes in your waveguide. And, in, and then uh, these traveling modes are the standard eigenmodes of the system. But then when you have uh, an electrons interacting, electrons, sorry, a two level atoms interacting to, to the waveguide, it well may be the case that uh, there, there will for, there will appear a bound state, which is a combination, a linear combination of, uh, of a state partially living on, uh, on the two level system and partially living on the on the waveguide so uh, where the um which is uh, which codes which is uh, named under the the the, the codes of uh, atom photon dress states this part here is the so-called photonic component of these dress states and is uh, essentially is given by this operator which technically is the resolvent of the uh, of the waveguide of the bare waveguide Hamiltonian. But um, 
the important things for what I am more interested in is how do you, that you can get a sort of intuition of how the interaction uh, happens between these atoms. The way of seeing this interaction is the following. The, if you look at the bound states, the dress states that is, it forms uh, due to this emitter here, and you put a second electron, a second, sorry, a second emitter in uh, con uh, uh, interacting with the waveguide, uh, you just need to look at the amplitude of the wave function or the photonic component of the wave function on the site on which the second uh, atom is interacting to. The amplitude here will essentially give you the effective interaction between these two atoms. And this is essentially the one way of understanding this expression here. Uh, naturally, if you, you can do the converse, and you, you, you will observe that there is a, a reciprocal effect, essentially, that uh, happens between the interaction from the first uh, emitters and the second emitters. And if the underlying waveguide is described by the Hamiltonian, which is emission, this interaction is bound to be emission itself, uh, as well, if uh, under the hypothesis that I gave you before. So, uh, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting for many reasons because that's a, a, this is a recipe to build interesting dipole-dipole interaction, interesting uh, of, uh, type of Hamiltonians between emitters. And on top of this, it's interesting because by looking at the properties of the of the waveguide, which, for example, could be a top, which for one example it could have, for example, some topological properties, you can observe interesting properties. On, uh, uh, on the effective Hamiltonian between, between the atoms. This is, for example, a very interesting example. Uh, this is a, an SSH model, which I will discuss later, which is a, just a, a coupled cavities with an alternating in uh, coupling between them. And the, uh, it is well known that under, uh, under a suitable condition, these systems develops the so-called edge states, which are localized states at the two boundaries. And if you put atoms interacting with, uh, with this uh, photon, SSH photonic lattice, you can observe interesting uh, bound states, which, are, which inherit some interesting properties of, uh, of the chain and the line chain. And similarly, you can play also with two level atoms, and uh, sorry, with 2D type of systems like the famous Aldane model. And if you put atoms or emitters on top of this, you can see very peculiar states or bound states with the photons orbiting around it in a, in a very interesting way. So, and then you can also develop interesting uh, uh, topologically dependent interaction between a couple of emitters, both coupled to this, uh, this, type of, uh, this type of lattices. So, but all these type of situations leads always to effective Hamiltonians, which are indeed uh, emission and which are, uh, which are in a sense complicated to, to work with because, because they are long ranged. So we want to go a bit beyond this paradigm and see what we can do with uh, if we have a non-emission photonic path. And this is actually the object of this, uh, of this uh, uh, work that I will describe now. So imagine that you have, for example, a structured array, but we all not only have a structured array in terms of coupling between, bit ato between atoms, but also the possibility of having a structured type of losses uh, between in, uh, in the system, so uh, which in uh, which encodes some non-emittivity in your in your in your system, and this is a prototypical example that you can uh, you can realize. Imagine to have this apparently very complicated type of uh, uh, lattice in which you have two main sides or a sides of type A and a sides of type B, which can which are. Uh, uh, coherently interacting uh, with this uh, with this coupling here, and then on top of this, uh, this you can add some losses, but only on uh, lattices of type B. So do you already see that you are structuring the type of losses? We are not putting losses everywhere, but just on these B sides. 
And so this already introduces, through introducing dissipation, introduces no hermeticity in your system. So let me uh, I'll, um, start enumerate some properties of this system. So we have a system which is essentially passive in the sense that you don't have to introduce or pump excitation in your system. You're only uh, losing excitation. And this lead, gives you the possibility of implementing this type of situation in, for example, in cavity QED, in which passive circuits much easier to implement. And there's also the system uh, presents uh, an exceptional point, meaning that when the coupling J and the value of the losses are tuned to these values, there are eigenstates on the uh, on the spectrum of the lattice that coalesce onto each other. And uh, also, let me uh, uh, let me stress that this system doesn't have a specific directionality, meaning that uh, this, the photons here don't specifically propagate leftwards or rightwards because things are perfectly symmetric, so, uh, left, right, left, or left, right, worldly. So um, uh, then, imagine now that we apply, we put emitters only on the side B, coupled only to side B. So, and we assume that the coupling is a rotating way of approximating type of coupling. Um, and these are all tuned at the same frequency. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the level of the effective Hamiltonian, which is mediated by this, uh, this uh, interaction, this type of interaction, this type of uh, lattice, uh, the, we will, um, you can see that the effective Hamiltonian has a very peculiar properties, which do depend very uh, interestingly on the rate of uh, the losses. Uh, in particular, you can see that if you plot the range of interaction between uh, between um, sites between sites on uh, between emitters, you will see that uh, the range of interaction. Uh, so how far away two emitters can interact with each other, uh, this range of interaction can be tuned with the value of gamma. And uh, it, if you go in the, in the emission case, which means for gamma equal to zero, you will see that the interaction is everybody with everybody. So every single emitter interacts with every other emitter. And this can be observed, can be understood in terms of this checkboard representation here, which essentially says which site, whether the site I uh, interacts with site I plus one or not. So these are, uh, this is the meaning of this, uh, of this um, uh, matrix uh, representation here. And, you can see that as you get, get gamma higher and higher, you at some point and encounter for gamma equals to, to the uh, exceptional point, you observe a very peculiar behavior. This peculiar in, in this point uh, co corresponds to a situation in which you have only nearest neighbor interaction. So not only one side to the next neighboring is interacting and not any others. So, um, and notice also that these plots here are independent on the field boundary conditions, mean, meaning that uh, we, I haven't specified what's the boundary condition of the lattice. The lattice in my, in, uh, in, 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 in general can be assumed to be periodic with periodic boundary condition. But if you change your boundary condition and you assume that the boundaries are open at the two ends, surprisingly enough, you get exactly the same type of interaction. You see this, this red dot here means that the last, the last emitter of the chain is interacting with the first emitter of the chain, which is completely understandable if the, if the lattice is periodic, but it becomes quite puzzling if you think that uh, the lattice can be open with having open boundary condition. So let me uh, repeat, what are the peculiarity of this, pro, the, of this system? Uh, you have an interaction with, which is chiral, meaning that the site I interacts only to the next neighboring only on the right, but the, doesn't interact with the next neighboring on the left. Uh, it uh, has peculiar, peculiar uh, next neighboring interaction at the uh, exceptional point and is insensitive to boundary condition. 
Let me try to um, give you an intuition of why this is happening. So the reason is essentially twofold. It uh, relies on not re no reciprocity of the lattice and bilocal coupling of, uh, of some bilocal coupling. And I, I'll show you what I mean for these two things. So um, the secret to understand this type of lattice is to make a unitary mapping on at the level of the cell. You can make a unitary transformation on this two uh, site cell here and transform in such a way that the lattice looks like this. If you do that, this lattice here, which with losses, become a lattice where you have losses in every side, but more importantly, you have interaction between next neighboring sides of the lattice, which is not reciprocal, meaning that the interaction rightwards is stronger than the interaction leftwards due to the gamma term, which introduces essentially a, um, a no, no reciprocity in the system, meaning the photons preferably want to propagate rightwards rather than leftwards. And uh, there is also an effect of, of this unitary transformation. If you look at the level of the interaction between the two level system and the lattice, you will see that the atom doesn't, doesn't interact anymore with a single side, but interacts with both sides. And this type of uh, coupling is the same idea that I, at the, at the beginning, I named giant atom. And or you can call it bilocal coupling. And uh, the, you see that there is a very specific uh, uh, phase shift between these two, uh, between these two uh, interaction here, which is comes from the uh, the type of unit of transformation that we assume. So uh, now, what has these two things uh, to do one to each other? Uh, so the bilocal coupling gives rise to an interesting effect. If a photon is emitted by the uh, by this uh, atom, it far it will then will go will propagate towards the right, and that's an effect due to the fact that this atom is interacting with two points on the lattice, and the photon emitted through this point and the photon and the part of the photon emitted through this point interacts uh, constructively if they are uh, propagating uh, rightwards and destructively if they are interacting. Uh, uh, leftwards, which means that the photon essentially is, uh, is propagating only in one direction. Uh, that's in a tight binding model. Uh, on the other hand, as I said before, the lattice has an intrinsic not reci reciprocity, meaning the photons in this lattice naturally wants to propagate rightwards. So you see there are two competing chirality. These two competing chirality, which is on opposite directions, give rise to the formation of a, of a dress, a localized photon stress, stress. Why? Because a photon, which is emitted by this, uh, by this atom, wants to be emitted towards the left, but due, the, due to the no reciprocity of the lattice, is kind of squashed towards the right. And this has an overall effect of giving rise to a localized and uh, localized uh, uh, dress, atom photon dress states, which localize around the atom. And you can see here in this simulation what's happening in various situations depending on the value of gamma. In the emission case, gamma equal to zero, you have a free propagation to the left, which is equivalent to the tight binding example that I was mentioning here. Essentially, photons propagate the right words naturally. As you switch on gamma, you see that the photon gets more and more localized nearby the atom. And that's in the extreme case of the exceptional point, photons is, is just proper, is just localized in the in, around the atoms and in the next uh, in the next state. So now we have a way of understanding the, the chiral interaction and the type of interaction that we see in these systems. Essentially, you have a dress state. And this is propagates in this direction. If you put a second atom here, you will see that this dress state sees only the atom when the atom is on the right and doesn't see as an atom was in the left, which means that effective interaction between these atoms is you have effective interaction, whether you have no effective interaction of on uh, between these two atoms. So that this explains the chirality of the interaction. 
but uh, as I told you, there is also uh, an insensitive, uh, the, the fact that the system is insensitive to boundary condition. And this is, uh, is, is expressed in this pictorial uh, situation here. So this is the lattice. If you open the boundary condition, the interaction between this atom and this atom is exactly the same as if they were neighboring here. So, which is very, very weird. And this is one way of understanding. So in the bulk, this is what I just told you, told you before. This is the type of interaction that you should expect. Is an interaction mediated by the dressed state. Whereas if you are in a situation where one atom is sitting at the edge of your system, you would think that the dress states look similar to this one, except that you don't have, you don't have lattices here to propagate your photon in this direction. So to the, due to the breaking of the translational invariance, what really happens is that you, uh, you observe the formation and extended dress states, which can freely propagate down here. And the reason why it can freely propagate here is because only the, the lattice above are lossy, are lossy lattices, whereas these, lat these uh, sites here are loosely, uh, are, are, are not lossless. Uh, sorry, these are lossless and these are lossy. So atoms propagating here can freely propagate. So when they propagate all the way to this side, and they get on the other side and they can interact freely with an atom put, uh, which is being put there. And interestingly enough, if you have atoms, other atoms sitting here in the middle of your chain, they don't see this photon propagating here, which essentially means that uh, the, the bulk of the Hamiltonian is completely untouched by this uh, opening of the boundary conditions, but it's only affecting the two extreme uh, extreme photons, extreme uh, uh, sides. So this is the, uh, the take home message of, of this first part in which I'll, I'll show you that having non-emission type of underlying lattice give rise to interesting, uh, interesting uh, effects, which you cannot have with emission systems. And in particular, you observe this, you can tune, thanks to the, uh, to the losses, you can tune the interaction so to have nearest neighboring interaction. And you can also have this peculiar uh, interaction which is insensitive, insensitive to the, the boundary conditions. So let's move to the next part of the talk. So, and to motivate the next part of the talk, since the main idea is, uh, has to do with the, uh, has to do with the, the topology uh, of, of the system. Let me just really briefly mention what I mean for topology. And the standard idea of topology is the topological system is the integer quantum effect in which you have the appearance due to the some magnetic field, the appearance of uh, edge states which are uh, uh, which are um, uh, propagating at the boundary of the system, and uh, which is uh, can be uh, probed to an interesting physical effect, such as the, uh, the all effect and the transverse uh, conductivity, which is essentially measured by the appearance of a topological number, which is the Chern number, this number here, which is an integer number. And one later on it was shown that this effect due to the, the presence of the magnetic field could be observed also, also in systems which is with intrinsic magnetic fields. So magnetic features are intrinsically built in the system itself. And later on, uh, we was shown that similar type of effect could, ob could be observed also in systems at the level in system in a, in a, in a, in a so-called quantum spinal effect in which you have propagation, not of charge uh, currents around the sample, but spin currents around the sample. And uh, uh, you, you, it was also shown immediately after that you can also have a similar effect with 3D systems, so-called 3D topological insulator, where you have, instead of have uh, currents flowing around edges, you have surface currents on a system which is uh, insulating in the bulk. So, and the prototypical example, which was uh, appearing, appearing before the, all this was the SSH model, which I briefly introduced before, in which you have similar topological properties. So why the interest in these things? Well, uh, you can mimic 
this type of condensed matter type of physics using photons, essentially. And that gave rise to a whole interesting uh, applications in uh, so-called topological photonics, in which you see uh, the um, appearance of uh, metamaterials in which, which, which particles, which photons can uh, manifest similar edge uh, behavior uh, while propagating in this, uh, spe uh, specific, in this peculiar type of, uh, of, of material, pretty similar to the topological effect that you see. On the other hand, are, as I told you before, I'm mostly interested in the quantum optical effects. So effect of uh, atoms interacting with peculiar structure systems. And uh, the idea essentially is to merge these two, these two type of ideas, merging quantum optics with topological photonics and see whether you can observe interesting topological effect at the level of the emitters uh, mediated by the underlying topological properties of the photonic lattice. So, and there are hints that this will essentially work well, as I told you before, there are interesting effects that you can already, already see at the level of the, of the single dress states uh, when you place a single atom on this type of environment. So now the question that I would, I would like to, uh, to put is very, in a way is a very simple. Given that you have an underlying photonic lattice, which, is, uh, which has some topological properties, what can you say about the, the properties of the uh, effective Hamiltonian, uh, which is uh, happening, which is uh, uh, ha uh, having, taking place between the emitters? Is it carrying also some topological information? Is it carrying some, is having, have some topological properties that we can we deduce from the topological properties of the underlying lattice. So that's that's the, the question I would like to uh, uh, answer in this in this topic. And again, we have the same setting as, as I showed you as I told you before. Uh, but uh, now with a, a simplifying assumption, we will assume that the, the emitters, which are coupled to the systems are uh, put on a very, uh, um, in a periodic manner. So, so that the, you can uh, re-express the effective Hamiltonian in the, at the level of the emitters already in a block fashion. So uh, this is block Hamiltonian of the effective Hamiltonian, which of the atom, atomic emitter Hamiltonian, uh, which obtained after the abatic elimination that I, I mentioned before. And as you can see, this is a very simply related with the block Hamiltonian of the underlying uh, lattice of the underlying uh, block Hamiltonian of the lattice. So now just let me mention what it's more mathematically speaking, what is topology in this type of context. So imagine that you have two emission systems. We say the two emission systems, you diagonalize them and you see the, uh, the spectrum of the system. You have these bands here. And then you fix uh, a reference uh, reference uh, reference state, which in our exact case could be, for example, the uh, the frequency of excitation of the emitters, for example. So we see the two states are a, a topologically equivalent. If you can go adiabatically from one from one Hamiltonian to the other. Uh, without closing the gap. So without having these two bands colliding into each other. That's the emission uh, context. In the non-emission system, you have a similar idea. But instead, you can have a, this very peculiar type of uh, spectrum in which uh, you have the formation of these loops. And you will say, you can say the same idea of topology in the sense that two, these two systems are topologically equivalent. If you can go from one to the other without crossing with this loop, uh, in, intercepting this uh, base state, this base energy EP, okay? This reference energy EP. So uh, now back to the classification that I was mentioning before. So as I said before, we can have integer quantum well effect and there's, this is, is essentially qualified, described by a, an, a topological number, which is the chern number, which is a, an integer number, a Z invariant. And uh, the, the existence of this topological effect is relates is related to the fact that the time reversal symmetry in your system is broken, and both in, in both systems. But you can have also systems in which you have not, you have time reversal, which is preserved, 
And in this type of situation, you can have topological environment with, which are peculiarly different. It's not anymore an integer, but is a Z2 environment, meaning that you can only have two possible values, either zero or one. And then you can have similar situations also in a 3D type of, uh, of situation in the 3D topological insulator. And again, also in the winding number, you can also in the SSH model, in which you have a type of symmetries called the sublattice symmetries, which guarantees that your system may have some interesting topology. And specifically, this, this topology is uh, quantified by a number, which is the winding number, which is uh, an integer environment. So why I'm saying this? Because this type of classification gives rise to the so-called periodic table or uh, Outland and Zimbauer classes, which uh, depending on the, the symmetries, which are the time reversal symmetries, um, uh, particle all symmetries of chiral symmetries, depending on the existence uh, or absence of the symmetries, which is here is expressed by a zero, the, the absence or the presence by a one, you can have different type of classes of, uh, of materials. And depending on these symmetries and depending on the dimensionality, which is one, two, or three in this example, you can have either no possible topology in your systems or a type of topology which corresponds to a topological number, which can be either uh, a Z number, like a churn insulator in this case, or, an, uh, or a windy number, like in this case, or you can have, for example, Z2 type of environment. So all is all dictated by symmetries and by dimensionality of the system. Similarly, <clears throat> in a non-emission case, in non-emission topology, you can have different type of classes, but you have a plethora. Instead of only 10 different symmetry classes, you have 38 different symmetry classes, which can be divided essentially into subclasses called AZ and AZ DAGA type of classes. And again, you can have two type of uh, invariants, which are Z2 and Z type of invariant. So integer or, uh, or Z2 integers. So now, very simply, the result. So the result is the following. So the, you have uh, that you can immediately tell that uh, what is the topology of the effective Hamiltonian on your, uh, on your, at the level of the emitters, depending on the topology of the Hamiltonian on the lattice. And if you call Ni P the topological number of your lattice, and knee A, the topological number of the effective Hamiltonian, you can prove that if the lattice is a Z2 uh, topological uh, um, uh, system, then also the effective Hamiltonian is also a Z2 topological uh, um, system with the same type of topology, exactly the same, which we call topological preservation. Whereas if you have uh, an underlying lattice, which is a Z uh, type of uh, phase, you can have two different possibilities. You can either have the same topology if the system is Hermitian or is odd dimensional, or uh, if is a non-Hermitian and even dimensional, uh, the, the system. So uh, whereas if you have a system which is uh, Hermitian and even dimensional, you can see that the effective Hamiltonian here inherits a topology, but with the opposite type of topological number. And uh, is the, exactly the same situation in a non-emission odd dimensional system. So that's essentially the uh, take home message that I want to tell you about the second part. So, but let me give you some few examples of what this means. So, uh, imagine that you have this an SSH model, the simplest example. So, which in which you have different cavities, photonic lat, photonic cavities, which interspaced uh, in, with different alternating interaction between between cavities. So, these are alternating interactions. So, imagine now that you open up the your chain. Uh, then the topological nature of your system is can be observed through the appearance of edge states, so uh, states which are localized on one side and on the other side of your chain when you open 
the boundary of your system. And these edge states have the peculiar properties of having the energy, which is exactly resonant with zero, meaning zero in this case is the bare frequency of the cavities. So now imagine that you now go back to your original situation with the, the system with close boundary condition. And now you put emitters uh, connected to every single site here. And now you do the same thing at the level of the emitters, the purple, the purple emitter here. You just open up only the emitters degrees of freedom. Now, if the system has the same topology of the lattice, when you open up this chain, you should observe edge states appearing. And this is actually what happens. You see the appearance, when you open up the boundaries here, appearance of edge states on the level of the atoms only. So now you can also play with different dimensionality. For example, you can have a 2D system, which is uh, analogous to the Aldane model. And if you completely solve the problem analytically under the condition that I showed, that I told you before, you can see that the system at the level of the photonic degrees of freedom shows up these uh, bulk excitations, sorry, these bulk modes here, which is at this gray area here and this gray area here, and also shows these edge states, which are propagating on this side and on this side of your uh, 2D photonic material, and which is given by these uh, lines here corresponding to this one and this blue line here corresponding to this side here. Now, let's put let's look at degrees of freedom of the emitters. Now, uh, the system, if you look at this narrow uh, line here, if you squint your eyes, this narrow line here is the degrees, or represents the degrees of freedom of the emitters which are attached, uh, connected to the, to the lattice. And if you zoom in, you will see a similar structure with, uh, with uh, bulk, uh, bulk energies here, on at the level of the atoms here. And you also see the appearance of edge states. But notice the edge states here are exactly with opposite colors that the corresponding edge states are in the photonic degrees of freedom. You see uh, pro, uh, photons propagating on this direction corresponding to this, uh, to this um, uh, slope here which is propagating in the opposite direction than the photonic degrees of freedom. Whereas you see exactly the same and the same, the same behavior on the other side. So you see that this is a, actually a manifestation of the fact that your system has a topology, which is exactly the, 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 at the atomic degrees of freedom. You, you have a topology, which is exactly the opposite than the topology of the underlying photonic lattice. And that's uh, the, uh, what this part is telling you. But you can do also a similar uh, argument in a non-emission case. And the prototypical example is the so-called Atano Nelson model, which is a model which is not reciprocal, again, similar to what we have described before, where we have photons which are tends to propagate uh, towards the left uh, more keenly than towards the right. So uh, this corresponds to this has a, uh, a spectrum with, with this type of shape, uh, this loop, and the, the presence of this type of loops has an interesting effect. If you open up the boundaries of your system, these are this loop represents, sorry, this loop is the band is the spectrum in when your system is has periodic boundary condition. When your system has this type of loop in the periodic boundary condition, something very strange happens, which is called the, the, the non-emission skin effect, which is manifested in the fact that when you open up the boundary of the system, all the states, every single, every single state of your system get squashed toward one side of your chain. In this case, uh, should be the, the actually the right side, uh, but never mind. In this case, is the so it should be the left side. But ne never mind. In this case, is uh, is the right side. Um, so uh, bear uh, bear in mind these are 
every single state of your system. It's not just one edge state. It's every single state of the system is a localized state, which is localized on the right margin of your, of your system. And this is to the fact that system- then, It would be great if you wrap up in five minutes. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Great, so I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. So essentially what, uh, what you can do is, uh, let's look what happens when you put, uh, when you put emitters on your system, then you will see that at the level of the emitters, you see exactly the same phenomenon. You can define a winding number, the spectrum, the winding number associated to the spectrum of your excitation, of your, sorry, of your emitters. And as you see here, the winding number, this red line here, is goes in the opposite direction than the, the windy number of the level of the lattice. And if you open up the, the lattice degrees of freedom on, uh, sorry, the, the boundaries of the emitters degrees of freedom, you observe a skin effect, but this time the skin effect is happening on the other edge of your lattice. So meaning uh, that you have a quantum uh, non-emission quantum uh, number, which is opposite to the one of the lattice. So um, this, is, uh, this is in perfect agreement with what is called emission non-emission correspondence, in which you can actually make a connection between the uh, topology of an emission D system with the topology of a D plus one dimensional, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the topology of one of a non-emission D system with the topology of an emission D plus one dimensional system. And this correspondence is, uh, is, is given by this, uh, this arrow here. So you can repeat the same, the same idea into D and see that you have, again, this, the appearance of this, uh, you can show that you can have an appearance of, um, of uh, so the so-called topological preservation, but I not, have no time to go into this. Let me just very briefly sketch what is the idea mathematically, why this is happening. Essentially, you have, uh, when you have uh, atoms which are in tune uh, with, the, the, with the wave frequency of the cavity, there is a mapping between the effective Hamiltonian and the photon degrees of freedom Hamiltonian, which is a very simple mapping. And which mean, and this is a, an automorphism, automorphism between the group, the class group, of the Hamiltonians of the lattice and the Hamiltonians of the effective Hamiltonian. So this means that if you have a group representation, in this case, uh, in a topological number of type two, the only possible automorphism uh, in, in this type of situation is the so-called preservation because the only automorphism when you have a Z2 group is just the identity. Whereas if you have uh, a, a, a topological uh, topological number, which is an integer, then you have a, a larger possibility, and the, the only the only two possibilities allowed uh, of automorphism in uh, between two uh, group of type Z, and these two possibilities are just the identity or the inversion map or the inversion automorphism. Then essentially what you can easily do is do the following trick in topology, which is so-called band flattening. So substitute H for the sign of H, which preserve the topology of your system. And when you do that, the mapping between the degrees of freedom of the photons and the degrees of freedom of the effective atoms be be becomes just a change of, change of sign. And you can show easily that the topological number can be expressed in this way when you have odd dimensional in this type of uh, topology. And uh, you can see that under this change of sign, this number is essentially an even number. Whereas when you have even topology, uh, the topological number can be expressed in this way, which easily uh, seen as an odd number under this type of mapping. So this show in a very easy way that you have this type of uh, topological preservation in Z2 or topological preservation 
and reversal, depending on the dimensionality of the system. You can actually repeat an analogous proof for non-emission systems with a similar trick, which is called unitarization rather than band flattening. But the essential message is the same. So just let me wrap up again. The, the take-home message is given by this, uh, this effect. You, have, um, you can have topological preservation for Z2 type of topology. You have uh, uh, emission, you, have, you can have either topological preservation or topological reversal, depending on whether the, your, your system is emission or non-emission, or whether your system is one-dimensional or two-dimensional. And that's essentially uh, the take-home message of both the two parts of the talks. And these are the people which are responsible uh, for, for both of these two works. And uh, I will, uh, I'll thank you uh, for, for the attention. Thank you very much for giving a very clear talk. So the room is now open for questions. So do we have someone here? So I, I probably can start asking my questions. So in the last part of your talk, you talked about the dimension of your system. So for instance, in the table that we have, we have 1D and 2D. My question is that have you tried to consider systems that are not having the same type of dimension, like for instance, your atomic system is in 1D, but your photonic subsystem is in 2D. Have you considered this possibility and how would this affect to your results here? Oh, that's a very interesting question. It's actually this, uh, of course, uh, affects a lot the results. It does indeed affect the results because this would, Im would imply essentially that you can think of, of your, uh, of your uh, say for example, that you have a 1D system or 1D emitters, which are interacting on a 2D uh, lattice. Um, well, you can think of this situation as if the 1D emitters type of systems represents a sort of uh, uh, 1D uh, edge of your, uh, of your system. Then the way of, of thinking about this uh, situation is more uh, on a different, uh, with a slightly different approach. You probably uh, would have to think of it as more like a, uh, an, a similar uh, physics as the edge physics that you would expect by uh, opening up your, uh, your 2D system, uh, um, cutting the 2D systems in correspondence to the presence of this uh, chain of emitters that you have made. So we actually have done something on this direction in, uh, in the past. And it's actually the, uh, the object of a different, uh, of a different, um, um, uh, Pub different uh, uh, publication that is uh, that I briefly uh, shown here. This publication here in this PRL, in which we actually uh, we actually look at what uh, what happens when you put uh, an atom, uh, a single atom, interacting into a into a, a topological uh, lattice. For example, a 1D lattice. And this uh, type of uh, configuration, you can actually prove that the atom itself behaves exactly as a defect, which means that inherits the edge state property of the defect that you would have if you had, a, instead of placing the atom, if you had opened up your chain in that same, very same point. So this is similar to your question, but in this case, you are comparing a 1D chain with a zero dimensional uh, system, in this case, the atom. But you, you can go, you can, you, can, uh, you can approach the same problem going, scaling up the problem and having, for example, as I told you before, a two level system, lattice system, in which you have a 1D, a chain of atoms, which would represent, which would behave as a sort of, uh, as a sort of uh, a defect or edge, if you want, in your system. So did I answer your question? 
Yeah, thank you very much. So do we have further questions? At the moment, I don't see any. So let me continue with one more question regarding the first part of your talk. So you showed that you have a, a you know, photonic system, which is coupled to a quasi 1D atoms. So could we also do uh, observe similar features as a response of the, for instance, how the um, boundary condition behaves in the case that we have a 2D systems coupled to our atoms? Because as I realized that the idea that you have a one corner states or the, you know, the, the points that uh, atoms can talk to the other side of the chain in the open boundary conditions, it lies in the fact that you're, you're taking advantage of the quasi 1D nature of your atoms. Could we generalize that to 2D as well? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. I actually uh, don't know. The, actually, the, the, that's a very, it's a very um, strange. So we have shown uh, this peculiar insensitivity to the boundary conditions uh, in this very specific uh, lattice model. And uh, actually in a couple of other lattice models, but we haven't yet come up with a very, a generalized reason uh, or why this insensitivity to the boundary conditions happens. So we have some clues and most of the clues of these insensitivities uh, is, comes from the, this, the, 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 the presence of this, uh, sorry, I'll go to the, comes from the presence of this photon uh, the presence of the existence of a mode in which the systems can freely propagate uh, along your uh, your uh, 1D system. So, at the level of already at the level of the single or the 1D uh, configuration, we we haven't yet understood fully uh, why this is happening and whether we can predict in a general situation whether this type of boundary condition uh, insensitivity can happen. But uh, I will guess that you can also generalize this type of uh, situation in a, a higher dimension, um, but uh, I, we haven't yet uh, done, but probably we will be keen on uh, having a look at that as well, yes. So. See, thank you. So do we have questions? I think uh, we don't have any also on the YouTube. I think Victor wants to ask something, right? Yeah. Uh, did you consider also including gain in this type of systems that you're showing now? Oh, um, we haven't really thought about gain because um, from mostly because we were oriented into systems towards systems which were easily done in a, um, in a cavity uh, uh, waveguide QED type of scenario in which uh, gain can be kind of troublesome. But uh, um, in, in principle, you can have uh, gains, but we haven't, haven't really looked at it. Uh, well, one possibility is simply uh, if you put, for example, uh, you can realize the same type of topology by simply adding gain everywhere in your system. And uh, the effect of this would be essentially to, um, to switch up the spectrum of your system, um, right? Because you are simply uh, yeah, switching up all the, 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 the spectrum of your system and, with, and without essentially changing the essential topological feature of your system. Uh, but uh, except from this mapping, we haven't really gone through much into details of what a gain can really do to the, to the system. That would be interesting because you can then can try to see whether PT symmetries have some roles, whereas our systems are not, uh, cannot be PT symmetric by obvious reasons. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Angelo, very much for giving a great presentation. Um, we we'll see everyone in next two months. So bye for now. Thank you. Bye.